Don't know what happened there. The start broadcast went away, Jerry. Is it on yours? So welcome, everyone. Here we are. Super excited about our next session here at um, 2 o'clock. We are so fortunate to have Mr. Damian Thomas. Uh, who is here uh, representing all the way from the D.C. area. Very excited about having him here and being a part of our National Day of Racial Healing uh, with Dallas TRHT. And of course, our executive director, Jerry Hawkins, who is going to uh, be having this chat with Damien. He's already told us to call him Damien, so I am uh, respecting what he has said. Uh, these two gentlemen are here to present to us and um, continue in the amazing conversations that we've been having. So, gentlemen, I'm going to hand it over to you and look forward to the question and answer at the end. Take it away, Jerry. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. Um, again, like Erica said, my name is Jerry Hawkins. I'm the executive director of Dallas Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation, where our mission is to uh, create a radically inclusive city by addressing race and racism through narrative change, through relationship building, and through equitable policies and practices. Um, here today with Dr. Damian Thomas. Um, he is the museum curator, curator for sports for the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, it's a museum that is very dear to my heart. Uh, I've visited multiple times, uh, even during the, even once during the pandemic. Uh, so I'm very excited uh, to have this brother here. I've seen his, um, you know, curation, his exhibit, uh, Sports Leveling the Playing Field. Um, just a little bit about uh, Dr. Thomas. Um, he's earned his PhD from the United States in the United States history at UCLA. In the museum, he's an assistant professor at University of Maryland, College of Art, and the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. We talk courses that focus on sports, in the United States history, sports, United States race relations, uh, and black masculinity. I'm very excited to talk to you, brother. He's the author of Globe Trotting African American Athletes and Cold War Politics. Um, so we want to welcome you, uh, Damien. We really appreciate you uh, being here with us. Um, my, my first, go, go ahead. I'm Thank sorry. You the work you're doing. Thank you. I said it's a pleasure thank to be you. here, and uh, thank you for all of the work that you're doing. No, appreciate you. Uh, so my first question to you is, um, you, you work in an institution that I, I visited, and I uh, implore, you know, after it's safe to travel, that everyone visits, you know, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, but I think this museum um, has changed a, a lot. So my first question to you is, you know, how is how has that museum changed the narrative about what happened in this country, particularly being um, not only the location where it is, but the content inside. Right. As you walk, um, you know, in, in the basement of that museum, you know, you feel a different thing uh, before you, you know, you, you, you enter, then you come out, you're a different person. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about the museum. I think the, the first thing the museum represents is, is in many ways possibility and struggle. It took 100 years to get, the, get our museum built. The first attempt to get our museum built was in 1915, which is an important year because that was the 50th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. And so Americans wow. from all the country, North and South, came back to DC to commemorate that moment to talk about the lessons the country had learned. And there were African-American soldiers who fought in the Civil War, who came back and said that there needed to be a national monument and memorial on the mall to African-Americans' accomplishments and achievements. And it didn't go anywhere. There was an attempt in the 1920s. Um, there was an attempt in the 1960s that lost momentum with the death of Martin Luther King Jr. In 1988, Congressman John Lewis of Atlanta introduced the legislation to build our museum, and he introduced it every single legislative session until it was finally signed into law by President Bush 15 years later. And then we opened a decade after that. 
So in some ways, the, the actual building of the museum represents part of our struggle, part of our battle to have our story told uh, on as at, at the place where the nation tells the rest of its history and shares its culture. And so it's also really important that our museum is located on the National Mall and located next to the Washington Monument. One of the things you often notice when you, you're looking at pictures of our museum, you often see the Washington Monument in the background. And, and that's quite intentional. One of the things we've been uh, criticized for at the museum is the design. Some people don't like it. They say it mm -hmm. doesn't fit in with the other neoclassical buildings on the mall, but they're missing the point. Our building is designed to be in conversation with the Washington Monument. And if you look at the angles of our building, it's the same as the angles on the Washington Monument, the color contrast and a couple other features were designed to create this architectural conversation between the Washington Monument, which is a symbol of America, a symbol of American ideals. We the people, all people created equal, endowed with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And in many ways, the African-American experience in America is a way to, to look at how closely the nation has lived up to those ideals. And so, our museum is all about thinking about how African-American history helps us understand who we are as a country and how far we have to go. And so one of the things that's been great, we've had, had almost 8 million visitors come into the museum since we opened in 2016. And, and, and the three main responses I think that, that we see is, is number one, an overwhelming sense of pride and accomplishment um, based on how African-Americans have made a way out of no way. Another thing that we begin to see is people begin to wonder, why haven't I ever learned this history? Why mm -hmm. are these things foreign to me? Why have they been kept away from me? So people leave sometimes with a sense of anger, um, sometimes with a sense of, of longing to want to know more. And the third thing that, that we often see is that because 40% of the visitors to the museum are not African-American. Um, what we see is that, is that people feel as if this is a welcoming place that allows them to come in. It's not a museum that's designed for African-Americans only. It's designed to be a place that welcomes everyone into learning, learning this history and the experience of African-Americans in American society. Well, uh, it's amazing. Um, just to think about that uh, 100 year history um, um, and the, the architectural fact. Um, I, I know the architect is recently passed, uh, but to think about, you know, seeing that museum and the panoramic view of that Washington Monument behind it is, is definitely breathtaking. Um, I want you to talk a little bit about uh, your role as a curator in that museum and um, you know, um, I just think about the emotions I had um, going through the the bottom and then uh, kind of the uh, uplifting spirit I had going up to the top. Right. Even though there's some still some some harsh realities in the top, there's still some some cleansing aspects to see some of the, um, you know, the, the beauty and the success of our uh, community, um, especially uh, in the sports realm, because that's kind of. Um, we all see our triumphs and, um, you know, these big things that are happening in our lives. So can you talk a little bit about um, your work as a curator and what the experience that you all were trying to uh, create? Oh, sure. One, one of the things for those who haven't been to the museum, like you, when you look at pictures of our museum, you're actually only looking at half of the museum. The museum is five stories above ground and it's five stories below ground. And, and that has a lot to do with the rules and regulations in Washington, D.C., where you can only build buildings so high because you don't want to block the views of the monuments. So we had to we had to dig down. And the way the museum is is organized, as you sort of laid out, the history galleries are below the gallery, which is devoted to slavery and freedom, which is about 20 percent of the museum is on the bottom floor. Then we have a gallery devoted to essentially the 19th century and and segregation. And then we have a contemporary history gallery 
at the top of that. And then when you go up to the higher floors, that's where you see the cultural galleries, the sports gallery, the music gallery, gallery called Making a Way Out of No Way, gallery called uh, The Power of Place, which is essentially where we talk about how Black identity is different and shifts across space and time. For example, what was it like to live on the Angola plantation during slavery versus what was it like to grow up in the Bronx during the 1970s at the birth of rap music? So we, we do that. In terms of the way the museum is set up in my role as a curator, the museum has 12 galleries, but one story. When Before the museum opened, um, many ways we were unprepared for the massive influx of people, the number of people who wanted to come to the museum and who wanted to go through throughout the, the entire museum. We had planned on people spending two hours in the museum, but what we came to quickly learn is that the average visitor doing their first visit is spending over five hours in our museum, which is almost unheard of. It's called the dwell time in museums. Most people will spend about 90 minutes in a museum. And so people have just kind of come in and saw all of this history. But when we were planning, the way I thought about the sports gallery was if people come into our museum and they only come to one gallery and they decide to go to the sports gallery, will they interact with the larger themes of the museum? And so what I didn't want to do was create a Hall of Fame which says, okay, he was a great football player, he was a great basketball player, but I really wanted to use sports as a, as a, as a entry point to larger social, political, and cultural histories. So what I tried to do is in the sports gallery is to tell African-American history through sports. And so I, I really wanted the pe people who can't tell the difference between a touchdown or a slam dunk, don't like football, can't tell you who's playing in an AFC championship game coming up. I wanted them to come out of it and say, I see why sports matter. I see why this is important. Because sports was one of the first places where African-Americans could compete on relative terms of equality, where they got a chance. And what African-Americans have tried to do is to use sports as a metaphor for an equal playing field. And African Americans do sports to say, look at what we can do if you open the doors to medicine, if you give us an equal opportunity in the business world, things of that nature. And so sports has become reflective of these larger struggles, these larger battles. And so one of the things that, that, that I tried to do in the sports gallery is to find that right balance between being serious and fun, because you don't want to rob sports of, of, of its fun nature. But, but one of the things that's interesting about the gallery is by color, it is the darkest gallery in the museum. It's black and, and gray. And I, and I wanted those colors because I wanted to have a sense of solemnity, a sense of seriousness, rather than, than the sports gallery being the fun section of the museum. But then I didn't want to rob it of the fun. So one of the things you'll notice, the music. I didn't want traditional documentary music. I wanted people to come into the sports gallery and to bob their head and then to look on the screen and see people that they know, Jamel Hill, Michael Wilbon. So we interviewed these ESPN reporters and then we put the statues in there because we knew those would be photo opportunities. And then you got the big video about African-American style and the politics and culture of style at the end of the gallery that draws your attention. And so figuring out how to have that right balance was really important. And so um, I'm just saying that to say that everything is thought out and we tried to make every space that we have meaningful and impactful. No, you could really explain um, see that experience and see the the thought and the production uh, behind it when you go and I encourage everyone to go uh, when it's safe um, and speaking of that um, you know obviously we're in a pandemic and uh, you know obviously uh, there's been shutdowns of the museums and 
uh, rolling openings, things like that. Um, how has uh, this pandemic changed the way uh, you all at the museum have been thinking about uh, sharing, uh, you know, the knowledge and the uh, cultural experiences that are in the museum? Um, I noticed that, uh, you know, Dr. Bunch was sharing how uh, folks have been um, curating artifacts and um, doing some archiving work with the Smithsonian. Uh, can you share a little bit about that and, and what you all are doing um, during the pandemic? Sure. I think one of, one of the things about our museum is in our title, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And, and we want people to come to Washington, D.C. to visit our museum. Um, I think it is, it is a, still the best expression of what we do. But we also have to be aware that there are people who will never make it to Washington, D.C. And so how do we get out to those people? How do we have conversations across the country and be, be um, the Smithsonian at its best? Which I think what the Smithsonian does well is it convenes people, it brings people together, and it helps contextualize. It helps people sort of understand the current moment and how it relates to past incidents. And so one of the things that we've done is we're, we're doing a lot of presentations online. Um, we are collecting artifacts. We are sort of identifying ways to preserve this moment. How, what, what are those sort of watershed moments that, 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 that we need to think about and collect. And, and it's interesting because it changes over time. In 2016, when I collected items from Colin Kaepernick, it was incredibly political. There were newspaper articles all over about the Smithsonian collecting this. And now what we've seen in the last kind of, the last four or five years is that his stance has gone from being controversial in many aspects of our of our culture to now being something that that people people have like Commissioner Roger Goodell of the NFL have gone back and said, you know what, we were wrong and we responded in an accurate way. And so what we're, and Cong what we're kneeling, uh, you know, Congress kneeling with uh, Kente cloth on their shoulders. Exactly. And so and so our charge is to figure out what to collect to help future generations and, and people today um, understand this. And that's why also in our name, you see, you see both history and culture, because we want to document the past, but we also have to help people understand the current moment as well. And those two things go hand in hand. And so what we're trying to do is to, to help people make sense of, of the current moment in contemporary issues. No, that's great. And I want to take uh, some audience questions because I think it uh, it's kind of a segue to what you just said is um, a couple of folks is asking if uh, the museum is providing virtual tours. Uh, and there's a teacher in here that says, is the uh, virtual field trip for students available? We have not put together a full virtual experience. That is something we have been working on with with Google and Silicon Valley um, for, for a really long time to, um, to, to, to set up something. I think it's coming soon where you will be able to walk through the museum on your computer. Um, but the technology and, and the, the resources and cameras that you need to be able to do that um, are, are um, it's time consuming. It's a time consuming product process. I mean, we got slowed down a bit by COVID and people not being able to enter the museum and some of the restrictions that um, that we're getting from from uh, from the uh, city council and the mayor. So it's it's taken a lot longer than we anticipated, but we are working on it. And that's awesome. Um, you know, another question you know I've been thinking about is um, how um, this museum is part of the entire Smithsonian. Um, because if folks don't know, the Smithsonian is not just obviously the museums, and it's a lot of museums on a national mall, but um, I remember my colleague uh, Erica and I, we were in 
uh, Anchorage, Alaska, the Anchorage Museum, and there's the Smithsonian Institute for First Alaskans in the Anchorage Museum. So we're talking about a, a, a widespread network of uh, cultural and learning institutions. Um, how has uh, you know the museum and um, the work that you were doing um, added to the national conversation about uh, not only African American people but people uh, in our culture? I think I think that's a really good good point and question that, that you're asking. When when our museum got authorized, one of the big fears that people had was that you would have this big national museum in Washington D.C. and people would go there and it would kill off a lot of the local um, and regional kind of cultural institutions and museums. And so from the very beginning, we've had an office in our museum, the Office of Strategic Partnerships, which is designed to ensure that the entire museum cultural field devoted to African-American history, devoted to race and equality, to, to ensure that that whole field benefits from our present. And so, as you, as you said, you know, we partner with, with museums all over, all over the, the country and all over the world to ensure that, that, that we are helping facilitate their success as well as our own success. And so that, that has been a major thrust of what, what we're doing is having both a national but also local conversations as well. No, that's great. Um, my colleague uh, Monique uh, from the Dallas Public Library asked this question. Um, what advice would you give about curating heritage collections on a local level? She said it's something that she's interested in doing um, at the library in which she serves. Um, so what, what do you think about that question, Damien? It's, it's interesting. You know, our museum was authorized in 2003, but we didn't open to 2016. And, and our director wanted, you, you know, he, was, he, he always said, we don't have a building but the museum exists, and what can we do? And so he tells the story of he was uh, up one night, couldn't go to sleep, and was watching TV, and the Antique Roadshow came on. And, and he talked about wanting to create a version of that. And so what the museum would do, and we still do this, is we'll go to various cities, we'll ask people to bring their artifacts in that have a lot of meaning to them. We'll have our conservation staff that helps them think about how to preserve it. Um, and, and, um, and we'll also hear their stories. And I think that's an incredible way to kind of do this, is to think about the people who are in your community, the stories that they have, that they want to tell, the stories that, um, that have been told to them by their grandparents and grandmothers and things like that. And one of the things we also do is have people interview their grandparents and ask them about what was it like here when you were my age and things like that. So I think really taking a, a community-based approach that invites the public in, I think is really important and significant. And I think that's something that, that, that the museum field is also learning more is that, you know, there is a place to have the curator and the expert um, sort of providing an exhibition, but people also want to be involved and they want to be involved in the, the, um, the creative process and the sharing process as well. And so I think, uh, I think the best projects these days take both of those things into account. Yes, that's, that's amazing to think about. And uh, I hope that uh, Monique, we talk uh, offline about that because we want to do that work too. Uh, I want to ask you a, a personal question um, as a black man. Um, this is a question I asked Nicole Hannah-Jones earlier today and my colleague Preeti. Um, you know, what are you doing um, to take care of yourself during this time? I mean, particularly we had the pandemic. Uh, we had the hard summer. Uh, you know, we were dealing with this. Um, you know, you're in D.C., I think, and dealing with this insurrection, this cool attempt, right? Um, what are you doing to, to take care of yourself, uh, and particularly thinking about this National Day of Racial Healing? Um, when you think about community care and self-care, what are you doing to take care of yourself? 
I think I'm, I'm going to answer this in two ways. Okay. Um, the first is a is 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 sort of about why I do what I what I do. Um, you know, I was a first generation college student, wasn't looking forward to going to college, got into UCLA and and went to the very last orientation you could go to. And one of the things I didn't realize was that was when you signed up for classes. And so by the time it was time for me to sign up, none of the classes I wanted to take were available. And I ended up with the worst schedule you could have, which included colonial history at eight o'clock in the morning. And I remember my very first day of class, 15 minutes into being a college student, this is what the professor said. He said, whoever controls the present will use their power to control the past in hopes of controlling the future. One more time, whoever controls the present will use their power to control the past in hopes of controlling the future. And in that one sentence, I learned two life-changing ideas. The first is that history isn't about facts and figures. It's not in 1492, Columbus sailed ocean blue. History is about power. It's about the power to define what matters and why it matters. And the way history has traditionally been used is it, 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 it's, it's taught to us in a way that makes us see the current moment as inevitable. It makes us see the current moment as some evidence of progress. And what it does is it erases all of the fights and the, the contention and the other ways and the other things that people were fighting. And so it's powerful to kind of know. The second thing that I learned is that history is not about the past. History is about the future. Because if you can use the past to control people's ideas about what's possible, you can convince African-Americans that blackness has always been looked down on in society and in a certain level of racial, um, tension is normal and natural. You can, can influence what they believe is possible. If you can convince women that women have always been in the home, you can control what they think is possible. And so history is about power and it's about the future. So in terms of thinking about, thinking about what I do for self-care is I do a lot of this, is I share our history share our culture, I help people understand the larger context of what's going on. And so what I do what to, 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 as part of my self-care is I try to help empower other people. And, and, and in some ways, I think I might get more out of it than, than, um, than, I, than I thought I would when I started this journey. And so sharing and in talking and helping other people work through this is is my life's mission, and I find it um, to be invigorating rather than draining. That's great. That's great. Uh, another audience question from Karen: uh, What are you uh, most proud of so far in your work you've done at the museum, and what are you looking forward to and hoping to accomplish in the years ahead? I also asked that question of uh, our guest earlier, you know, about legacy. What do you what do you want your work to stand for? Or what do you want it to do? It is an honor to me to serve, to serve my people and to serve my country in this capacity. And that, and that really is how I look at it, that in many ways I am entrusted with sharing this history. Um, and one of the things I do a lot of times, I spend a lot of times walking around the museum. Um, often with sports teams, we've had probably 25 NBA teams come. Um, we have, we've had five or six NFL team come and different people, Commissioner Adam Silver from the NFL, or I'll spend an afternoon with Damian Lillard walking through the museum. And I've walked through this museum hundreds of times, but you never know when something that you share with them or that you're going to point out to them is mm -hmm. transformative or yeah. it becomes that one piece of knowledge 
that kind of unlocks something or helps them understand their grandmother or their, their family or their neighborhood. And so to me, what I want my legacy to be and the legacy of the museum is that that people have come to the museum and been inspired, uplifted, encouraged, and and become committed to ensuring that social justice continues to to be something that we fight for. And I think about how other people have done that for me. I think about going to a lecture. Um, this guy, Randall Robinson, who helped found an organization called Trans Africa, um, and they were fighting against apartheid. And he started this organization in 1974. And he said this, and it changed, changed how I thought about them. He said, when we started Trans Africa in 1974, we never thought we would see the end of apartheid in our lifetime. And it's just this idea how do you fight a fight that you don't think you can win? Where do you where do you muster that kind of internal fortitude when all hope and all sort every, anything you can see says that that, that you're going to fail and succeed? And that's the history of African Americans who made a way out of no way, who walked only because they could see a northern star. And that's the only guy that they have searching for their freedom. Um, and so it's, 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 that's what motivates me. And I hope that's what the museum does for people. It inspires, uplifts, and encourages people. One of the things I also say this about the museum is, is I think the museum gives people a lot of good history and information, but I also think the physical building is really important. In some ways, the museum is a bit over the top. It should, it's a bit of grandeur, but I think that's psychologically important because historically, you know, our, our, our African Americans organizations, you know, we've had to, had to work from the premise of what, what is it going to take to get the door open? Or, or, or how can we just, how can we make something out of nothing? And for our museum to be this place of grandeur and 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 a bit of ornateness, I think has a has a positive psychological impact as well. And so I think um, that that that's what I hope is that people leave committed and transformed, and that I've somehow played a small part in that. Man, no, the light keeps changing in here. I see you. I see it. I see it. That's the East Coast light. Yes. Uh, we have another question from the audience uh, about um, uh, fetishism and um, the contact. You know, sometimes when we have uh, different uh, groups of people interacting in the museum, you said that uh, you know, forty percent of the visitors are non not African American, non Black people. Uh, in in your your work, do you encounter uh, you know? Um, some of those themes that touch upon how, uh, you know, people, culture clash and how sometimes folks can fetishize, particularly athletes, right? Um, it's kind of that um, we're not human, we're either subhuman or superhuman, particularly with athletes, right? Like LeBron James and some of the other athletes who are featured in your sports gallery. How do you, how do you contend with that in the museum? I think one of the things that happens is that when you create any sort of, art form or anything that can be interpreted, you you don't have complete control of what people do with it and how they they use it or try to transform it, sometimes to, to meet their own agenda. When it comes to the athletes, one of the things I try to do in the in the gallery is to be explicit about some of these things. The idea that that people think that sports suggest that African Americans are different in meaningful ways. And, and what that conversation always comes back to is somehow defining African Americans as, as inferior. Because it's, it becomes this kind of thing where African Americans are biologically superior, 
Therefore, by contrast, they're intellectually inferior. And that's a relatively new thought in American society because one, one of the things that's unique about America is how intertwined sports are with our educational institutions at the high school level, the college level. If you go across the world, you don't have sports teams like this. But historically, American, the American sports creed has said that intellectual ability and athletic ability go hand in hand and they reinforce each other and they go together. And, and it's not until African Americans start to become dominant that then people start to make that inverse argument. And so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's become a powerful way for people to try to, to say that sports don't matter and that, and that sports success doesn't have implications from, from um, the other world, uh, the other aspects of society. And so what we see in that, that instance is a lot of times, you know, African-Americans sort of figuring out how to play by the rules and then the rules change. And so that's a part of this story. It's a part of this history. And so throughout the gallery, we point out some key moments where that, where that takes place because that's part of the ongoing conversation and battle about what does sports mean? What do any aspect, what, what do other aspects of African-American history and culture mean for us as a, as a nation, um, but also in terms of uh, these issues related to equality? It's an ongoing battle. Uh, this last question uh, is, is um, a good one too, um, from uh, Donna James Harvey. She asks, is there an exhibit that gets little attention, but is especially moving for you? Um, and she prefaced that by talking about uh, one that is near and dear to me in my hometown, Chicago, which is the Emmett Till exhibit, um, which is obviously incredibly moving. Um, but if there's something, is there an exhibit there that really strikes you that, that gets little attention to? I, I go um, to the Emmett Till exhibition, you know, still to this day, and it still kind of kind of gets me, particularly as we start to learn more and more about that story. For example, you know, it wasn't until two, two years ago that, that we learned the extent of Emmett Till's speaking impediment. And so while the white woman said that he whistled at her, he had this stuttering problem. And his mother told him that when you have struggle, you're struggling, whistle through the word. And so it's just, you know, we're still learning and, and, and getting new details that add levels of analyses to, to some of these histories and stories. And I think that's, that's one of the great things about our museum is that then we're able to kind of share those new ideas. There are so many places in this museum um, that kind of do that. And, that. and I think that's the great thing about the museum is that, is that you never know which of the 3,000 objects are gonna be those objects that, 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 that speak to you. And, and it, it's, it's I, 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 could, I could give you a hundred objects, but I'm gonna give you one. In the museum, in the, in the slavery gallery, there is this red flag um, that, that it's just a plain red flag that's from Charleston, South Carolina. And it would be hung outside the, um, the market on the days in which enslaved people were gonna be for sale. And the reason that it's something that most people kind of walk by, but it, it speaks to me, one, because I was recently in Charleston, South Carolina, and in that neighborhood and in that environment. And so it just has this kind of deep resonance with me. And I think it speaks to a larger, larger issue that's, that's important that I want to mention is that when you are trying to teach people, you wanna give them knowledge, but you also have to move people emotionally. And, and I think sometimes some of these objects 
speak to people in different ways and have that kind of emotional kind of residue. And I learned this from my grandmother. As I was raised by my grandmother, my grandmother would um, would would uh, invite me to go to church. And this is when I got got a little bit older and I didn't go as much as I probably should have. Yeah, yeah. Say, Man, Reverend Jenkins preached today. And I'd be like, oh, what did he preach about? And she'd be like, well, you know, it was some something in the Old Testament it might have been exited. I don't, I don't know, but it was good. And the point was that she couldn't give you the scripture or the verse, but that emotional impact stood with her much longer than figures and facts and things of that nature. And I think as educators and as people committed to this work, we always have to keep that in mind, is that we have to communicate on these multiple levels intellectually and knowledge and content, but also be attuned to the emotional um, energy and, and ways that we could impact how people feel and think about and think about these things. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we just want to thank you for being here. Before I turn it over to Erica, I do want to offer a critique of the museum and then offer an artifact to the museum. So when I was looking in the museum, I didn't see a lot of Dallas, Texas. So I recently acquired this lynching postcard, which is also featured in the 1619 project. And, you know, I want to add this in some way to the museum because this is one of the most important artifacts, uh, you know, from Dallas, Texas, uh, the lynching of Alan Brooks. So I'll be in contact with you all, brother. I really appreciate you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas, for being with us and for sharing your brilliance. I'll turn it over to Erica. Thank you both for a great conversation. Um, I did have one question, um, Dr. Thomas, if you would answer it. So um, you said that on average people were spending five hours in the museum, which is amazing. Um, but if I only have 90 minutes, if I only had that amount of time, where would you tell me to go to have the most impactful experience of the museum, um, knowing that I would return later? That's a that's a that's a really good question. It's it's hard because different aspects of the museum resonate with different people. But if you had 90 minutes, you've got to go to the Slavery and Freedom Exhibition because that is the heart of, of what our museum is about, is reclaiming and sharing histories that are lost. And what we try to do is to play, play within an international conversation, just to the extent that it's just not an African-American story, but it's a story about Europe. It's a story about uh, the African diaspora. And so what we try to do is to say that the history of slavery is not just African-American history, it is world history. And you cannot understand the modern world without understanding slavery. It is, it is, it is the, I would say it's the most important thing that has happened in the modern world, in the last, since in the modern world, beginning uh, with, with um, Columbus, coming to the new world. So 1492 to the present, slavery is the most fundamental thing that shapes our understanding of who we are as a world. And so I would say you should start there. Absolutely. And we've been talking a lot about making sure that we know our history and are telling the truth. So I think that that would be a good start. Well, thank you again. We so appreciate you. We have used up your time and we have loved the conversation. Um, to our attendees, we are almost there. You all have done a great job. Uh, we're getting ready to head into our last session. Just a couple of things before you start to log off and get to that next space. I do want to take a minute to thank D Magazine for allowing us to use um, Excelevance as our platform for doing our presentation. They they were just so kind to allow this to happen and it has worked really well for us to be able to do this and have these amazing conversations and presentations all day. I also want you to make want to make sure that you thank our TRHT team um, for putting together this con this conversation that has just been amazing, even though we've been virtual. 
Uh, it has just been a really good conversation and so thankful for Imani and Marta who are new to our team. You'll get a chance to meet them. I'm Jerry, myself, and especially Stephanie Drenka. If you get a chance to see her or talk to her, you make sure and tell her thank you, thank you, thank you, because she got us all oriented to this platform and she got it all set up. And so we want to make sure and do that. And then finally, to our steering committee who supports us and all the work that we do. We are so thankful to them for allowing us to uh, do the work that we do and continue to be able to reach out to meet our mission. It's all about ending racism, a radically inclusive city. And that's the work that we're going to do. It is. Uh, long term work. We understand that, but we are willing to to do that work. So we want to thank our steering committee for doing that. So, uh, Damien, thank you so much again. We will be seeing you. And hey, uh, everybody head on over. We're going to end this broadcast and head on over to the main stage so that you can get in and we can hear Jerry and wrap up the um, afternoon. Everyone have an amazing afternoon.